the, in my opinion, and this is this similar to Seth in the sense that uh, the direction is slightly different, but I think it's very important to choose your market before you choose your product. Uh, because ultimately your cost per acquisition for the customer and the lifetime value of that customer will determine the economics and whether they work or not. So uh, for me personally, uh, I like to try to scratch my own itch uh, and that is also what Ev at Twitter has done, certainly what, J what Jack did there. Uh, so, so start with a very small niche? Yeah, so for example, um, Ev at Twitter, and this is true with a lot of successful entrepreneurs in the Valley, they say, God, you know, I would really just like a tool for this, for expressing myself, for really brief snippets of status updates or whatever it might be. And then they build that tool effectively for themselves, yep. recognizing that if, if you're guessing at the size of a market, you might not have any customers. But if, if you're building something for yourself, at least you have one successful <laughs> user case. OK. And uh, from that point, I think it, it becomes so a matter So take yourself as a target. Yeah, take yourself as a target. Mm -hmm. Because you'll know how to develop the value proposition for that market, at least. And uh, from that point, it becomes a matter of testing. So uh, whether that's with book titles. In the case uh, of my book, I tested the book titles and subtitles on Google AdWords. Mm -hmm. Uh, so had a multivariate test running for one week for about $150. Uh, but uh, that would also entail looking at different types of price points and so forth. And you don't need to actually be manufacturing product or selling a service in order to do that testing. Uh, and it, it's really a matter of determining which metrics matter and then measuring those from the very beginning. And so are you one of those entrepreneurs who uh, uh, likes to launch very early with a product which is not finished? Um, and get as much feedback as you can, or are you, the other school is more like you do it in secret, and you, you test, you do market research, you do everything in secret, and you launch when you consider it's, it's really good. So I think that you can do both, actually. So I think that it's possible to get that early feedback, which is critical, without making it uh, public, in the sense that you can work even with a small group of friends, which is what I did um, with the book, but also with uh, some of the startups that I'm working with, uh, get feedback from people who represent different demographics, uh, then incorporate that into the beta when you, when you make it open. Uh, but I generally believe in, in fast sprints. So let's just say two-week development sprints. And uh, so that uh, might combine with agile uh, development. But do two-week sprints, push something out, get feedback. Take a brief rest, do another sprint, get a few features out, wait, get feedback. Uh, and uh, Google also does this on a fairly large scale. So when they launched Google News, for example, they were wondering whether they should sort by uh, location or date. Uh, and there were a few other variables. And they decided that they would push it out and simply see how many requests and complaints they got related to each of those features. And almost no one asked for location. Mm. Uh, most of them asked for date. So that's the feature that they built into it in the next iteration. So I believe in, in micro-testing. Uh, I'd say it's generally my approach. And, and, and so you don't want the team, right? Uh, I, I, <laughs> I've read I, your book. No, no, no. So I think, I think having a team is fine, but the objective isn't increasing headcount. So the objective of a business, uh, the, there can be many, but in simplest terms is to provide a product or service of value and generate a profit and to keep a very close eye on those numbers. And... Uh, that is often in the world of venture capital, especially when entrepreneurs have pressure from their investors uh, to add headcount, uh, people lose sight of that. And uh, you can build a team, but in my case, so for example, with the, the company that I founded in 2001, I ended up with between 200 and 300 contracted employees. So is that a team? It's 300 pretty, contracted employees? Yeah. So it's a How pretty, do you manage that? So uh, the secret and, is And that, all around the world, I guess, I right? don't, Yeah, all over the world. So the, the products were distributed in about 15 countries. Uh, and I had five or six uh, managers who were responsible for different areas. So let's say customer service, fulfillment, uh, quality assurance, uh, product sourcing. And they had a very high threshold for independent decision making. So basically, at one point, I was doing something like 60 hours of customer service a week, which was just, uh, but it wasn't from customers. It was from managers asking how they should handle specific cases. So I just said, look, for anything that costs less than $100, you make the decisions. I don't want to hear about it. The customer is your customer, not me. And immediately raised that bar. I was looking at the financials first. They would log their decisions and then send me an Excel spreadsheet, first on a weekly basis, then on a monthly basis. And uh, I was able to cut down to less than two hours a week because now they had the freedom to make decisions on their own 
rather than me building a manual that could never cover all the use cases. It, it's, it's very counterintuitive, and I had suffered with the consequences of adopting the customer's always right belief for a very long time. And the fact of the matter is that a, a very important part of your business is selecting who your ideal customer is. And that ideal customer, in most cases, is someone who is extremely high profit and very low maintenance. All right, and that's one of the benefits to having a premium priced product. Right. Is that self-select. But if you don't do that, in my case, I had, uh, there were about 120 wholesale uh, customers or distributors. And when I did an 80-20 analysis of the income being generated by the cu those customers, about five, uh, actually eight of them were generating more than 90% of the profit. And then of those eight, there were two who were effectively professional ball breakers. I mean, they were just very difficult. <laughs> very Can you define a professional yeah, ball, so breaker? ball breaker? It's a scientific term. Definition, right. professional Macro. ball breaker <laughs> by Tim Ferriss. Right. Uh, <laughs> people who are extremely abusive and just have problems in their own lives that they like to uh, turn into uh, abusive conversations and relationships. Uh, and I took that as a cost of doing business. Uh, and. I recognized at a later point how much that carried over to my personal life, how much that resulted in um, decreased self-worth in my own eyes. And uh, so we sent out a, a letter to all these customers saying these, just as an update, these are a number of our new corporate policies having to do with how orders should be placed, types of contact. And uh, if you have any trouble adopting these new policies, let us know and we'll be happy to suggest a new provider. And so it's like go to hell, basically, but, well, politely. Well, politely, because we would have people who would send orders to the wrong people in the wrong format, and that would delay, of course, the delivery. And then they would call us to rant and rave and uh, and abuse uh, the people that I was responsible for, and that that was just at some, at one point unacceptable. But a few case studies, uh, I mean, Steve Jobs does not believe that the customer knows what they want necessarily. Uh, to, there's no one path to productivity. Everybody has different personality profile, different priorities. But the one way to be completely unproductive is to try to make everybody happy. That is. Which is the same for a business, you can't, right? Yeah, uh, absolutely. That is the surefire way to completely fail to produce any type of result that you're defining. For some people who are watching this or listening to this, they want to have a venture-backed startup, or at least angel-backed startup, that'll have an exit in the form of an acquisition uh, or an IPO. Uh, in this market, probably acquisition. Um, and in that case, reaching a certain critical mass and scale is very important uh, because a, a 2x return is not satisfactory for <laughs> any VC that I know, certainly. I mean, they're looking for a certain internal rate of return. Uh, so you need the, the, the potential for 20, 30, 40x for a lot of these people to invest in the first place. So you have a financial obligation to your investors. Uh, for those which requires size. Which requires size. And the easiest way to get, one of the easiest way to get size is to give away what you do for free. Mm. Uh, because it removes one of the biggest barriers to entry, which is price. It's like if Twitter ch started charging right now, I would yeah. pay, yeah. but they wouldn't grow as fast. Right, right exactly. So the, the, so, and, and that brings up the point, and we don't have to go too far into this, but it's, it's not how, you, then you have two sets of metrics. You have the metrics that you use, and then you have the metrics of your, that your potential acquirers use to determine the valuation of a company. And those are not always the same thing. So uh, that turns into a much bigger conversation. But like if you're going to be, if it's a private equity firm, that's different from a strategic purchaser, and it gets very interesting. Um, for a lot of people listening, they might just say, you know what, I don't need to have an IPO or a venture-backed company. All I want is to make what I'm making now, but have control of my time. In that case, uh, I think it's extremely important certainly if you're not depending on someone else's bankroll, um, to test uh, paid product from the very outset uh, and to have live and die uh, by, uh, by positive or negative cash flow. So from the very outset, I've never taken outside funding for my own companies. So you have uh, never? Never. So I think that... Why not? Uh, because I felt confident that I could do the micro testing early on, so that I could generate revenue from day and one. You don't want to bother with uh, partners and uh, I know stockholders, shareholders. Not at this point. I mean, I think that there's some there's a certain sex appeal to having a you know real company, 
and having a capitalization table and having investors and this and that. Like, I'm not going to lie. I mean, even the, there is some attraction to that, even for me. Like, to have some really kick-ass investors and, you know, not to say that I could do this, but, I mean, if you can slap the name Kleiner Perkins or Coastal Ventures on your website, yeah, that's cool. It's really cool. But there are a lot of responsibilities that come with that. Um, and for most people, if they're looking at not a, uh, not building an enterprise, not building a, a, a mass scale business, then you're looking at effectively a lifestyle business or a lifestyle design, in which case uh, you really need to understand cash flow and um, whether you reinvest capital or deploy it elsewhere. Uh, there's an excellent book uh, on uh, reading financial statements, uh, actually. Uh, I think Warren Buffett wrote the introduction, which I would recommend all entrepreneurs read. Learn to read financial statements, extremely important. 